Lord, can you hear me? I'm here fighting, pressing to remember what you said. But this onslaught of thoughts fills my head with dread and I need you. Like enemies encamped, shrouded in the dark, I can feel the fascination of too many temptations reaching for my heart. So I need you to hear me. For I know your ears are attentive to the righteous, and I know that your ways are certain. Even when my worries would trample me to dust, still, I know you are good. Your hand is just. So come now, be the salvation for my sins. Help me to begin again, that you would mend this trend of hopelessness. God, deliver me in my brokenness. I can feel your presence, even now in the ugly, in the mess that has been made. You surround me with your benevolence. Yes, your love is on display, and I can see it. Carving roads through the struggles and the troubles, past temptations and devices that seek to choke me out. So come fear, come failure, come opposition or doubt. Jesus, you are my deliverance. Your grace is sufficient. Trusting you is my only way out. Now I turn my mind to dwell on your truth. Curate the condition of my heart to manifest joy. Be my living proof. Subdue the haters. Quell the voices inside. Transform me, Lord. Extinguish my pride. You've won the battle. I trust in your plans. Yes, God. I surrender all my worries, my woes, and my demands into your eternally capable hands. Hello. Some of you are awake. That's good. It's very, very good. So, um, We're doing our 21 days of prayer, and hopefully you're getting participating in that. I want to go ahead and just put a plug, though, on the next series. We've got this week and next week in the 21 days of prayer to finish that up. And um, actually, we're speaking this week and next week on why your prayers don't get answered. I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But I want to give a plug to the series that's coming up after that one because we're going to, it's going to be probably called uh, Take a Deep Breath. And it's all about mental health. It's about getting yourself into the right space um, spiritually and emotionally using the biblical principles for how to do that. And I want to give you just a little tip that I use. It's one of the things that I find really helpful, and this is just like a preview, an advanced tease for you, um, is I, I like to find ways that just make me smile. Find little things in your life that just make you a little bit happy. Like one of the things I've done recently that makes me happy, it just makes me, you know, not, a, not laugh out loud, but just happy, is, I hope you notice, you go to a lot of restaurants now, they'll bring you the box to pay with, the big black plastic thing, and you put the card in, and, and when it's done, it says, how do you want your receipt, right? And it gives you, like, a lot of times three options, it'll say, you can print it, you can email it to yourself, you can text it. And a lot of those receipts, I just don't want. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't really need to have a record that I took Kim to Highway 55 on a Tuesday night. It's just, it's not tax deductible, no value at all to me. So I'm like, how can I make this enjoyable for me? So what I've been doing for about a month now is when I get that option and I don't need the receipt, I text it to Pastor Barry. And of course I didn't tell him this until first service, but what that allows me to do is just get a grin, just a little bit of a smile out of it, because I know what's going to happen. He's going to get a text, and he's going to pull it up, and if you know Pastor Barry, he has this grunt he does. It's not a really big grunt. If, if, you, ever, if you watch Ted Lasso, uh, Roy has a, this uh that he does, and Barry's got like one third of that. It's just uh. And it's really cool to know that somewhere I just remotely controlled managed to make Barry go, uh. And so I, I encourage you, look for ways to make yourself smile just a little bit. And I, like I said, I told him first service right there. It was fun for that. We had a camera person in place and everything because 
I, I don't do a lot of practical jokes, but when I do, I want to remember them because they make me smile, okay? So, a little tip for you. If you need Barry's number, just text me and I'll tell you so you can do the same. We'll just keep it going. All right. <laughs> today we're talking about something that's a little more serious than that. We're talking today about why your prayers don't get answered. And there are enough reasons it's going to take me two weeks to sort of cover them. But we've been talking about prayer. We've talked about the fact that when, when we pray, we come into God's presence and we can do it boldly and that he hears us. But a lot of times we're asking God for things or there are things that we want or we need and it doesn't seem like anything's happening. So what do you do when your prayers aren't getting answered? Or why don't prayers get answered? And we're going to start out in Matthew. Jesus is talking and he's talking about prayer, and it's a really important teaching. And I want to start there. I'm going to look in Matthew chapter 7. And Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. That's really simple. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And then he's going to give us the rationale why we can come to God with boldness and confidence. He says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. Now I have to stop here, because I know some of you, and there are some of you, that if your son asks for a fish, might just slip him a small garter snake. I know, I, know who, I know you are, sitting in the back back there, I see a guy that probably actually did that. But normally speaking, if your ch- child is actually hungry, you give them food. And then Jesus says, if you then... Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And you want to know what the biggest reason most people aren't getting answers to their prayers? They're not asking. We're not coming before God and asking him to answer our prayers. Why do we do that? There's there's a, a number of reasons. One... I, I can relate to this one a little bit because people treat you differently. You know, in, in my position, I get two different extremes of people. There are some people who have watched online four times and they think we're best friends now. They think they know me as well as anybody and they sent me an email once and I'll run into them at Walmart and I have no idea who they are. And they go, hey, Pastor Steve, how's it going? You know that email I sent you and how that? And I'm going, actually, I'm not going to like it. I'm going, because I've learned to do this when I have no idea who this is is talking to me because this person, I've never met him before in my life, but they saw me online twice and they think they're my best friend and I get a smile. There's some people that way. More people, though, are like the other extreme. I was in a, a, a store or a restaurant, I forget which it was, and I heard this little kid going, that's Pastor Steve. That's Pastor Steve over there. That's Pastor Steve. Parents are going, shh, shh, shh. That's Pastor, but that's Pastor Steve. Shh, shh, shh. He's busy. I'm not sure how busy I can be in Walmart. Really and truly, I don't know. But, but they have this idea that I am way too busy to talk to them. And I think a lot of us will get this idea that somehow God's a little too busy for us. He's got way too much going on to listen to our prayers, especially the little ones. Especially the ones that are small. Because, you know, God's so big, why would he want our little prayers? Can I tell you a secret? When it comes to God, you've only got one size prayer. Eensy weensy. When you're the all-powerful God of the universe who moves the stars around by your fingers and calls light into being with your words of your voice, you ain't got nothing that God's sweating about. I don't know if I can handle that one. God's not doing that. Do, do, you, know, do you know what you should pray for? In Philippians, it tells us what we should pray for. It's not the key part of it, but it says, in Philippians chapter 4, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See that first part? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. You know, when something becomes big enough for you to pray about it, when it at any level makes you anxious. If at any level this thing makes you anxious, it is big enough to pray about. It's 
like I said, every prayer you have is eensy beensy to God. It's not like he's going, oh, he doesn't have time for that. He's kind of this infinite being. I don't know if you know that about God. He's kind of like infinite, which means he's got all the time there is. He created time. If he needs more time, he can make more. That's the cool thing about being the creator of time. Well, Steve, what, what do you consider worth praying about? I have been known on more than one occasion to pray for a parking spot. Now, only if I'm anxious. There was one time, this was years ago when I was an assistant pastor at a church in Philadelphia, near Philadelphia. We were about 45 minutes outside of Philadelphia, and we had somebody who was in the hospital, and I got to the office that morning not expecting anything and said, Steve, so-and-so's in hospital. You need to head down to Center City, Philly. So I go jump in my car, and I head out, and I check, and I have a grand total of 50 cents. And in Philadelphia, 50 cents back then would buy you 15 minutes of parking. Additionally, believe it or not, I am not the world's best parallel parker. I grew up in Maysville, West Virginia. There is not a great demand for parallel parking in Maysville. So A, I've got 50 cents, and B, I'm heading into Center City, Philly, and I'm not good at parallel parking. So I'm coming down I-95, and I'm going, God, I could really use some help here. I could really use a parking space. I'm literally playing, praying for a space this big. That's what I'm praying for. I get down to Philly. I whip around a corner near the hospital, and I see a spot. And it's one of those, there's a little extra room for people who don't parallel park very well. If I remember correctly, I might have been able to even pull in and do the little dipsy doodle thing, which for those of us who are terrible at parallel parking is what we're always hoping for is enough room in the front to just pull in and wiggle. And I pull in and wiggle, and I get out of the car, and I walk over, and there's 45 minutes on the meter. I go ahead and put my 50 cents in. I've got an hour to get up, go to the ho- go visit the person in the hospital, pray for them, get back in my car, and go home. Okay? And the reason, you know why I got that? You know why God did that? Number Two reasons. Number one, he loves me. I have to remind myself of that one. You know what the second reason God did it for? Why he did it? Because I asked. Because I asked. And some of you are so busy or so crazy about what you think God's up to that you're not wanting to ask him things. You don't want to bother him. Shh, shh, it's God. Don't bother him. He's busy. He's got all the time in the world for you. So don't be afraid to ask for anything that will make you anxious. That's the level, okay? Matter of fact, James says, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Simple as that. Now, let me give you, I I like, this series, I try to be really, really, really practical because I'm trying to push you and encourage you into praying. And um, I'm going to give you some real practical stuff right now. You need to remember Do you have a Walmart rule? I have a Walmart rule that's this. I will will hold in my head up to three things I'm getting at Walmart. If I need to get milk, bread, and eggs, I'm good. If I have four things, I write them down. As I I have found with years of experience, if I have three things, I'll remember them. I'll forget the fourth one or one of the four every time. I'll go, into, I'll go into the store, and I'll get three of the four, and I'll spend the next seven minutes trying to figure out what the fourth one was, and then buy some chocolate and go home. At least my wife will be happy. All right? So if it's four, I write it down. Well, I pray for more than four things on a regular basis. So if you're going to be serious about your prayer, like this is my opinion, you need to be writing the stuff down that you want to pray for. The stuff that's important enough for you to pray for, put it on a list. Matter of fact, if you start doing this very long, people will ask you for things. You'll see needs in, in your life. You'll see needs in people's, other people's lives. And your list will start getting big. And I use this. This is an app I use. It's called Prayer Mate. And I have it on this tablet. This tablet right here is my devotional tablet. I'll get up in the morning. I will read. Right now I'm reading a psalm. Then I'll journal. Usually in the book of Romans is where I am right now. And then I open Prayer Mate. 
and I'll go through my prayer list on prayer mate. And the cool thing about prayer mate is it lets me divide things up by different days. So certain things I pray for on Monday, others on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because I'm I mean, just praying for, for you guys takes a while. So, you know, you're, you're getting one day a week. I hope you're okay with that. Because the, otherwise I'm speed reading my prayer list to God. I don't think that's appropriate. So I break it up into sections, and this app allows me to do that. So I would encourage you to do something like this. If, if you're just getting started and you want to just write it out or type it out or whatever, but get yourself a list to remind yourself the things that are important enough to pray for. If it's important enough to write it down for a trip to Walmart, it's important enough to write it down to pray for it. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let's go back to this here. James said, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Now, this is in the middle of a really interesting passage. James is talking about a lot of things, including prayer. And after he says this, you don't have what you want because you don't ask for it, he gives another reason you don't have what you want. He says this, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure. Okay? First reason we don't get what we, what we want from God is we don't ask. The second reason is we ask selfishly. Okay? Let's go ahead and read that entire section. You'll see what I'm talking about in there. It's pretty heavy. It's kind of the exact opposite of Matthew 7, where Jesus says, ask and you'll receive. He comes up with a different angle. They're brothers, so they have to disagree some. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Now, here's, we're still on the parent view, by the way. Because in, in Matthew, he said, God is our parent, so he gives us what we need. Because, I mean, if you're a parent, you like to give things to your kids. You enjoy that, except when your kid is being a grade A jerk. Right? Have you ever done this? I do this. I have, like, like the grandkids are swarming. I've got five of them, and they're just swarming. And they want bananas. And one of them comes up to me and says, Papa, can I have a banana? Sure thing, honey. Here's your banana. The other one goes, give me a banana. No. No. I'm not rewarding that behavior. You ever do it to the kid? They're, 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 they're asking for something very reasonable, but their behavior is such that you know you can't give them what they're asking for because you get the behavior you reward. So if my child is being an absolute pain in the butt, or my grandchild is being an absolute, or any, your child, if your child comes up to me and asks me for something as being a jerk about it, I'm going to say no every time. Because I am the adult here, and my job in every situation is to help grow people. That's what I do for a living is I help people grow spiritually and emotionally. And so if they're doing something that's going to actually hinder their spiritual or emotional development, the answer is no. And God's a good father. So when you come to him and you want this thing because it's what you want right now, no. I don't care what it is. I don't care if you want air. I'm going to give you a plastic bag. No. Because you're, you're putting yourself as the spoiled brat in front of God. And he's not, he's, no. But we put that in extreme, but we can be very selfish with our prayers. We can be asking for good things, but we want them selfishly. D.A. Carson says, how tragic... If our prayers for good things leave us still thinking of ourselves first. Okay? Still thinking of God's will primarily in terms of its immediate effect on ourselves. Still longing for blessings simply so that we will be blessed. And all of us, do you, do you, know, do you know what percentage of, of humans are selfish? 
That's part of our fallen nature. The number one thing in fallenness is selfishness. And all of us are selfish. And if we are not careful, we'll start asking God for good things for bad reasons. Okay? It's one thing real specific. God puts things in your life. Do you know why God brings most things into your life? A lot of things at least. So you can help other people. Okay? I'm looking around. I'm here. I'm assuming if you're watching on the internet, this is true of you too. You got most of the stuff you need. I mean, if I didn't get anything for the next few weeks, I'm probably okay. I mean, if you ask me when I get home, I'll say there's nothing to eat. But realistically, I could make it a while. Okay? Plus, I've got some stores built up over the past few weeks, and I'm ready to go. We don't need much of it. I try to even train myself not to say I need this, but to say I want this because there's very few things in life that I need at this point in my life. Okay? I just want things. And so I need to make sure that I am not asking for selfishness. Matter of fact, um, I like to, when I come across somebody who's got a really cool little short prayer, sometimes I'll put it, that on my prayer list and I'll pray it. And Tim Keller had a, has a really good one that I've written down. And he starts out and says, first, Father, give me the right attitude for what I'm going to pray for. And then he says, Father, give me enough so that I can give to others unsparingly, unselfishly. So God, pass things through me so that I can help others. One of the things I do, and this is, I'm just giving you, I'm not such, I still got so far to go. So if it ever sounds like I'm at all bragging, I'm not, okay? I'm just saying, well, Steve figured out how to tie his shoes. Yay. Um, one thing I, that I've, I've reached a point in my life that um, I can afford a book, especially a Kindle book for $9.99 or cheaper, and I'll come across somebody who, who just needs a book. You know, my, like my nephew needed, was, was wanting something. I just sent him the book. I just like, here, here's the book. Here's, here's a book. And I can do that. I mean, that's not a huge thing. It's not, well, it can be life-changing if the book has the right impact. But it's like, okay, what, what's my level? What do I have? What am I able to now give away without worrying about it? We all are pretty much there, right? I mean, it may not be the same exact level that mine is. Yours might be higher, yours might be lower. But there are certain things you can give away without it impacting you at all. Because you're, you're planning to do something like nobody here looks to be starving to death right this moment, right? So there are things you can give away without worrying about it. And so God, give me the things and then give me the eyes to see what you want to do through me. Because I don't want to be, I already am selfish. I don't want to be more selfish. I want to work on being less selfish. And one way to become less selfish is to give as much away as I can. Because this is a basic rule of finance. If you can give it away, it doesn't own you. If you can't give it away, it does. And there's a lot of things that can sneak in and own us if we're not careful. And the way to avoid that, generosity. God, give me this so I can bless others. You know, I, it's okay for me to keep, it <laughs> doesn't have to all go away. I'm not saying we'll live like a pauper, but give it so I can bless others. Now, this next reason is from James also. We're going to go to James chapter 1. And James is going to um, mess with your head for a little bit. He's gonna, this, is, this is just going to blow a lot of your away with what he says in, in James chapter 1. Because what we also do to not get our prayers answered is that God answers, but we ignore the answer. We just ignore it. He answers, we ignore it. Now listen to this. this is, you, you don't think that's possible. Listen to what it says in James 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Okay? If you lack wisdom, what do you do? Ask God, and what happens? It will be given to you. Hmm. That seems really simple to me. I mean, I'm not the most complicated guy in the world, but that sounds really simple. If I lack wisdom, so if I need wisdom, I ask God, and he gives it to me. Hmm. That is cool. But you know what it doesn't say? 
If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, and he'll give you warm, fuzzy feeling to let you know you're doing the right thing. I know a lot of times people are looking for wisdom, but what they want is bottle rockets. They want a plane to fly by with the sign on the back that tells them the answer to what they're talking about. Okay? They want to open a fortune cookie, and there it is. Yes, take that job. They want somebody, a stranger, to walk up to them on the side of the street and say, God's just told me that you should accept that position. That's not what it says. It says if you ask for wisdom, he gives it to you. See, here's something I found about most people. Most humans have a brain. I've been a few that don't. Most humans have a brain. He gives us the ability to reason, to analyze things. Wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge to life. And he gives us all some of that. And so what happens is, here's a situation. I need to make a decision about it. I need to know what the right thing is. And God, and we look at it and go, well, logically, here's this. There's things you're supposed to do if you're looking for wisdom. You pray, you read the Bible, you ask wise people. And you do it. I know so many people who are waiting for the skyrockets. They're waiting for the fortune cookie. They're waiting for the spectacular thing. God's already answered your prayer. Go for it. Okay? Matter of fact, what happens is, if you're praying for wisdom, and what seems like wisdom isn't the right thing, that's when God intervenes. That's when God sends the the real the, the distressing feelings and all that stuff to make sure you don't do what you think you should do. But if he doesn't say anything else, this is wisdom, do it. And Steve, that does not sound spiritual at all. It's not about being spiritual. It's about having faith. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God Give us generously to all without finding fault. It will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. You're asking for wisdom, but what you're really wanting is fireworks. But what he says to do is, I will honor you if when I give you the wisdom, without the warm fuzzies, you just do it. You believe and don't doubt. But Steve, how do I know it's God? If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. How did I know it was God? Because I asked him. And he says he gives me wisdom. And I'm moving forward with that wisdom. I'm also looking to make sure I'm not being selfish. Those kind of things are playing into this. But if it is the obvious thing to do, this is weird, do it. I have had people... Who, I'll be talking to them, and there is such an obvious thing they need to do. But they're, they're, they're just waiting. They're just waiting for God to just pour warm fuzzies all over their lives. Why do you think we do that? Because we don't want to exercise faith. Okay? Because acting without warm fuzzies is faith. And we want to do it without faith. Do you know, really, if, if you're waiting for the feeling, that's not faith. Right? Am I, am I wrong here? But Steve, I will eat. Yeah, you like the warm fuzzies. Good for you. We all do. We all look for that extra nudge from God. He's not obligated to give it to us, especially when not doing it is a sign of a lack of faith. Because I'm trust, I'm wait, I, I need the rockets. I need the signs. I need to throw my stick on the ground and it turn into a snake. Sorry, Moses, it don't happen very often. God says, "Go." We go. The door opens. We walk through it. This is this is going to sound absolutely terrible. Seventeen years ago, going on eighteen years ago. I was in Philadelphia. I'd been fired from one church position, and the church plant I was doing at that point was folding. I'm talking to a friend. He said, you want to come to North Carolina and plant a church? Do you know what God said in my heart at that point? Not a thing. Do you know what my wallet said at that point? Steve, you need a job. you know what my spirit said at that point? You're called to be a pastor. You're not allowed to do anything else. 
You know what else my logic said? Ain't nobody else in line to hire you. There were no warm fuzzies. I mean, I hate to break this to you guys. You think so, there were, I, I, I bet I bet you were driving down the interstate and there was a there was a there was a you know a billboard that said go to Spout Springs. Nope. There was just wisdom. There was a family that needed taken care of, mine, and a dog and a couple and a car payment, and there was an opportunity to do ministry and get paid for it, and there was nothing else on the table. And I said, yes, sir. Seems like God's done a couple things through that. Hmm. Quit waiting for the lightning. Just obey. Do the thing you know is the right thing to do. Um, because if you think about it, isn't that how parenting works? If, God, if, we, if we view prayer as the, core, as the interaction between the child, us, and the father... When they're four, I tell them everything, right? Time to get up, time to brush your teeth, time to change your underwear, time to everything. When they're 10, I'm telling them less because they've learned a couple things. I shouldn't have to tell my 10, I probably do, but I shouldn't have to tell my 10-year-old to change their underwear on a regular basis, okay? When they're 15, I better not be saying anything about brushing your teeth. And right now, my soon-to-be 30-year-old daughter, I know I can't be old enough to have a daughter that old, is in Atlanta going to a concert by herself. She's a Taylor Swift fan. She's going to the concert by herself. I gave her no instructions except be safe, right? I think we've hopefully trained her enough that if some guy drives up in a van saying, want some candy, girl, she'll say no. Because the whole point of maturity, one of the whole points of maturity, is I don't have to micromanage anymore. And a lot of you haven't allowed yourself to grow to the point that you're not wanting God to micromanage every aspect of your life. Put on your big boy spiritual pants and your big girl spiritual pants and follow the path he's leading you on without stopping every three steps to say, is this the right way? Brush your teeth. Okay? All right. That's the the third reason we don't get what we ask for, is we ask, but we don't have enough faith to act on what he tells us. The third one is the tragic one, though. Because we're impatient. I like to, my, my preferred time to get something is yesterday. Right? I'm, I'm a real microwave kind of Christian, but microwaves aren't quite fast enough for me. Anybody else ever stand beside the microwaves telling it to hurry up? You know, this thing boils water in seven seconds, and I'm like, but you hurry up. But the problem with that impatience is we bring it into prayer, and a, a really big reason we don't get what we ask for is we quit asking. We bring it before God and bring it before God and he doesn't do it immediately. And so we just quit. Here, the Bible says, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. There's a, an example in the Old Testament. A woman named Hannah. Some of you know the story, some of you don't. Hannah just is one of those characters who just sort of blips on the Bible screen for just a couple chapters, then she just disappears and we never see her again. But she has a meaningful interaction during that time. And Hannah's in a really bad situation. She's married to a guy who has another wife. He's married to, she's married to, he's got two wives, which, frankly, it, it pegs my ability to, to be a husband to one wife. I don't see how they even thought about doing two. I just don't. But anyway, this guy's got two. And in that culture, the most important thing, and that's just how their culture viewed it, the most important thing a woman could do was produce children. That was their purpose as they viewed it there. And unfortunately for Hannah, the other wife was very good at having babies. And Hannah was not. Hannah didn't have any kids yet, and she was pretty torn up about it. 
Now, her husband actually liked her better than the other one, but she still didn't have any kids. And once a year, they would go to Jerusalem for a, for a festival, and, well, to the temple for a festival. That was actually in Shiloh. They would go to the, to the tabernacle for the festival where the altar was. And every year, Hannah would, would say, God, give me a child. Please give me a child. And she would go home and not have a child. And she would come back the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year. And there came a point when she was really, 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 really broken up and despondent about it. And so she's actually sitting in the temple area, the tabernacle area, and she's praying and she's doing something rather odd for that time frame. She's praying silently. Now, we're used to praying and reading silently. They didn't do that. Everything, everything came out verbally. So if they were praying, they prayed out loud. But she, for whatever reason, was praying. I guess she didn't think it was important enough, or she didn't think other people would be okay with it. So she's praying silently, and her lips are moving, and she's very passionate in her prayer. And the priest looks at her, and he thinks, what's going on with that? I bet she's drunk. And the priest I literally thinks she's drunk. And he walks over to her and he gets on her for being drunk at the festival here in the tabernacle. And she, of course, is already distraught. So this just brings her down seven more notches. And I, I, I can't picture her but not be weeping about it and saying, God, I'm not, I said to the priest, I'm not, I'm not drunk. I'm just, I'm just praying. I don't have any kids and I really, really, really want kids. And the, and the priest is, he, he's kind of embarrassed. And so for that, and I think God speaks to him and says, okay, you're going to have a kid. God is God's communicating to me, you're going to have a child. And so she goes home, and sure enough, she gets pregnant. She waits till the child is weaned, and, and she literally, and she told God she'd do this, she brings the child back and, and leaves the boy at the temple, and the priest raises him. And his name's Samuel, and... He has two books of the Bible named after him, First and Second Samuel. He's one of the most powerful cr people in the Bible, one of the most famous. And he's Hannah's child because she just kept praying. And it's really important that you never quit praying, that you don't give up on it. She keeps praying. Matter of fact, if you've got kids, the kids are studying Hannah today in the children's ministry about praying and not giving up. Um, I personally have another story about not giving up. I, I don't share it very often because it's a really good story, and although I did it like first Wednesday a few weeks ago. Because I grew up, you guys know, Central West Virginia, little church, the, the, the prototypical little brick building church with the steeple on top. Okay, and I grew up. We went to that. That was our church, and one of the members of that church name was Maxine. And Maxine literally lived within sight of the church. But this is hill country, right? So Maxine didn't live there. Maxine lived there, right? Here's the church. Look up. There's Maxine's house, Dri winding driveway up to her house. Maxine's husband was named Chester. And I had no idea what Chester looked like. I'd never seen him before in my life. Maxine was at church every week. Chester was never there. I couldn't have picked him out of a lineup. First time I ever remember seeing him, I saw in silhouette because I went to a basketball game at the high school and... I needed to ride home, and Chester took me home, but it was dark, and I still didn't ever see him. I don't think he said four words to me the whole trial. Took me home, dropped me off, brought me by. So I never saw him. But here's the thing. Chester was far from God. Maxine was a pretty good Christian woman. And in our church, the way we grew up, um, we had church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And on Sunday night and Wednesday night, at least, we would all gather down front for prayer. And they'd ask Whoever was leading the service would say, any prayer request? And Maxine was always standing right there, and she would say, pray for Chester. Every week, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and if we did it Sunday morning, she did the same thing. Pray for Chester. That was her prayer every time. Pray for Chester. I'm praying for Chester. I don't know what he looks like, but I'm praying for Chester. Then some stuff happens. We end up starting another church. Maxine comes to the new church, and we're there, and we're doing the same thing. Sunday night, Wednesday night, pray for Chester. Still don't know what he looks like. One day, though, we're building the building we're going to have the church meet in, right? We're actually physically, I helped build it. It's still standing. Miracles happen. Didn't help a lot, but I helped some. And I'm outside, and we're working, and I look, and here comes Chester's truck. Now, it's West Virginia. I don't know what Chester looks like. I know what his truck looks like. Here comes Chester's truck. Chester drives up to the thing, gets out, pulls out a hammer, and starts helping us build the church building. Okay? Hey, hi, Chester. You're Chuck. Good to meet you, Chester. 
then Chester starts coming to church. He actually starts showing up at our services. And now they sit here. Maxine sits right, right about there. We don't have a seat there. And Chester sat next to her at church. And every Sunday night and every Wednesday night, sometimes Sunday morning, we gather up front for prayer. Maxine would work her way over to this side. And we'd say, you need prayer requests. And Chester's sitting there. And Maxine would say, pray for Chester. Every time. He didn't want to look at Chester. He just look at Maxine. Pray for Chester. Best I know... Maxine went to church every week and said, pray for Chester for about 30 years. People could give you the exact date, but that's pretty much how long it went. I went back to college, praying for Chester every week. Hurry up, Chester. And one Sunday, Dad is the pastor. He gives the invitation. Chester's standing right there where he always stands took his Bible, and he, his, his songbook, and he closed it, and he put it in the holder, and he walked up, and he shook Dad's hand. And I think he said something along, I think it's about time. And he accepted Christ for the rest of his life. He was a student of the book. He was in the Bible all the time. He, they were back to satellite dishes that were the size of a small trailer. You know, he had one of those in the backyard, and he would find every Bible teacher on the, in the space airways. And I'd go down to his house, and we'd watch one or two of them together. And he just loved to talk about the Bible, and he was a great Christian. And Maxine prayed for him, prayed for Chester, for roughly 30-some years. This may not be a fair question. What if Maxine quits at year 20? It's not a question I like to ask, and theologically it's complicated. But is there something in your life you've been praying for long enough that you're getting tired of praying for it? Is there something in your life you've been praying for and God's not working at your speed? God's got a lot going on. It's not that he's busy. He's got a lot going on. He's working a lot of things. A guy named Robert Barron said this, the Lord wants to stretch us, expanding our desire so as to receive the gift he desires to give us. There's things he wants to give you, he plans to give you, but he hasn't stretched you enough so that you're ready to receive them yet. And until he does that, what's my responsibility? Pray. Pray. When do I quit praying for it? When he answers. Okay? If God has it on your heart to pray for something, don't quit. He may be just expanding your desire to have it. I mean, you ever had something you wanted for a really, 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 really long time and you finally got it? How was your gratitude level when you finally got it? As opposed to the thing you didn't have to wait for at all. God is stretching you, he's expanding you, and sometimes that stretching means, I want to wait till you're ready for this. One of the illustrations I used at the very beginning of the series was about how we ask for things in in God's life, which is not a a good thing to request, like a four-year-old who lives in an apartment asking for a horse, you know? But what if... It's not just the four-year-old who wants the horse. What if there's something in us that makes us want to pray for? We just feel like we're supposed to pray for us, but we're still living in an apartment, and we're asking for a horse. What, what's, what's, can I tell you something about God? He knows your future. God might be putting something on your heart for you to pray for, and you're going, I could never have that. And I'm going... Never? You're saying it's impossible? Have I mentioned God doesn't understand that word? That, that when, when you bring the universe into existence by your, mat, by your breath, there's no such thing as impossible. It may look impossible. 
We might be the equivalent of a person living in an apartment praying for a horse, not knowing that at five years God's going to give you a ranch. You know what he's got for you. You don't know how big his dreams are for you. You don't know the great things he might want to do through you. So ask, seek, knock. Don't underestimate him. Don't underestimate his love. And don't underestimate how much he might want to do in and through you. Because the only limits on what God can do in and through you are your obedience and his power. Oh, and his power is not a limitation. So pray. Don't quit. Don't give up. Check your motives. Pray. And it's possible today that God's got something on your heart that you're wanting to, that you're praying about that maybe you're getting ready to give up on. God, that's been too, uh, too long. That's not going to happen. No. I'd encourage you during this next song, if there's something that you're praying about and it's really burdening, it's really heavy on you, maybe during this next song you might want to go over to that cross and, and, and take, a, take a moment and pray. You can stand, you can kneel. We don't have a lot of restrictions on how you can pray. Or if you'd like, there's some people who will be around the outside of the auditorium. And if you'd like to have somebody pray with you for something, there, there, there is a power in hearing somebody else voice your prayer. There is a power in somebody else asking God for what you're wanting, what you're asking for. So maybe during the next song you would pray at the cross, or maybe you want to catch one of these people that's lined up on the outside of the auditorium and say, hey, could you pray this for me? It's top secret. They're not going to, go, they're not going to broadcast it. It's also possible you need to remind yourself how much God loves you. So we have these communion stations. There's one here and there's one over there under that cross. If you want to take communion to remind yourself just how much God loves you because there might be something that you're praying for and you don't think God loves you enough to answer that prayer. You're wrong. In communion, when we celebrate Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in our lives is a reminder of just how much he loves you. So keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. Keep on praying. And the next time you want to quit praying for something, remember to pray for Chester. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you love us more than we can imagine. Thank you that you, you don't regret the fact that you call us your children. That you do that with love. And Father, today, I'm, there's, there may be some people in the auditorium or online, and there's something they've been praying for a while, and, and they're tempted to give up. They're tempted to quit. But Father, you've placed that in their hearts. You've put a desire in their hearts that they don't understand, maybe. Or maybe it's just something where they've been waiting and waiting and they're just tired of waiting. But Father, give, give us, give them patience to keep on asking. And Father, for the ones of us who sometimes struggle believing that you love us enough to answer our prayers, remind us of your love. Help us to remember there's nothing too small to ask of you. Lord, you're the God of parking spaces. And Father, help us to trust you. Help us to love you. Help us to obey you. And help us to pray. It's in Jesus' name I pray.